Shalom friends, my name is Jason Weiner. I serve as the rabbi of Cedar sinai Medical Center here in Los Angeles, as well as the Knesset Israel Synagogue of Beverlywood. And I'm really honored to be giving this shir for the Torah LA gathering for the Orthodox Union West Coast. And uh, thank you for asking me. I'm honored to be with you and to learn with you and to share some ideas. This is um, just some issues that we're dealing with today and just some general ideas just to help frame a conversation um, I'd love to hear your feedback. The topic that I want to address and just delve into a little bit with you relates to the vaccine issues, you know, on our mind right now. We've been dealing with this pandemic for quite some time now. And finally, thank God we have vaccines that the FDA has approved. Of course, there's not enough for everyone right at the beginning. And we have to make some decisions about how safe the vaccine is, how halacha encourages us to um, to, to deal with it, if it's required to take the vaccine, and then in particular, how we triage the vaccine. Since there's not enough for everyone all at once, who goes first, who gets first? Assuming people want it, how do, they, how do we decide who gets it first? Now, of course, the government isn't necessarily asking rabbis what to do, and we don't expect the government to ask the rabbis um, what they can or can't do. But of course, for an observant Jew, our guide, our compass is the Torah. And it's important to, for us to know what the Torah tells us about this. And of course, there are times in our lives where this, some of the questions that I'm going to deal with today are relevant. And we do have to make decisions. And knowing these sources can help us to actually implement some of these decisions. And there are hospitals around the country here in the United States, and certainly in Israel, where there are triage decisions being made by individuals Who's con who are concerned about Jewish law, and that some of these principles might be relevant in their particular decision-making process. And so um, I wanna just share these values and I hope they can be helpful and interesting. And I look forward to hearing feedback. This is really a work in progress because so many of the issues that we've dealt with this past year are, are, are new. And even if they are related to previous issues that have been dealt with throughout the Torah, we're applying them in new ways. And so much of it is, um, is still fresh. So I'm going to share my screen a little bit. I'll share with you some sources. I'll come back and forth so we can discuss. But the first question that I really want to deal with has to do with vaccines. Now, this is different than measles, mumps, rubella vaccine that people get as a child. It's different than the annual flu vaccine that people are encouraged to get every year. I recognize that. This is, these vaccines have been approved through emergency use, use authorization. They don't, haven't gone through the same amount of years of trials, though they have been tested very rigorous, rigorously. Um, but a quick discussion, just, a, just quickly, because really it would take a full, a full hour at least um, to really delve into the issue of our va is vaccination mandatory by Jewish law. But I just want to share a perspective on it, just, just some basic sources to help frame the discussion as we begin our, to talk about triage. And so when we ask this question, are vaccines mandatory? I mean, for me, there's really one primary source that we go to in the Torah. I often mention it in my shul um, when we come out to that aliyah every year. I just kind of point out, like to point out sometimes, you know, you read a verse in the Torah, and obviously, of course, it's interesting and profound, but you don't always realize how relevant it is in our world today. And some of these verses are being, you know, debated by medical ethicists and, and lawyers and rabbis um, in the modern world. And they, they mean, they really mean a lot. Um, so if, when, we admit, when we begin discussing this issue of vac the, vac the requirement to be vaccinated, I'll share my screen here so you can see where, where I am. And of course, if you'd like um, this source sheet, I'm happy to send you an email. I put the email, my email address on the sheet there so that you can see it. It's jason.weiner, W-E-I-N-E-R at cshs.org. Just send me an email and I'm happy to um, send you the sheet. Again, jason.weiner at cshs.org. Some of them I translated, some of them I didn't have a chance to yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll translate them all as we go. So is vaccination required? First of all, I think the Torah has something very clear to say. As I was mentioning before, there's a verse right there in the Torah. It says, Ech, it's, it, the, the Torah tells us, in fact, before I read you this Rambam, let me tell you, the, the Torah tells us that we have to have a maka. We have to have a, I think they call it a parparet, you know, a fence around the roof. This is back in the day when, you know, the, the houses had flat roofs, you know, like a pueblo. And uh, people would walk on the roof sometimes, and it's dangerous up there unless you have a railing. So there's a requirement from the Torah to put a railing on the roof. Vasisa maka begagecha. So the Rambam says on this, this is here the Rambam, Hilchos Rotzeach, Perik Yudalaf, chapter 11. 
um, Halacha 4, Dalit. He says, Echad agag, v'echad kol davar sheyesh po sakana. It's not just about a roof. That verse in the Torah is teaching us a principle. Echad agag, both a roof and anything that's dangerous. V'roi sheyechashel baha adav yamus. And it's potential for a person to get hurt or die from that danger. Kagon, shaysa lo be'er or bor b'chatzer. Let's say that someone has to come some kind of a pit, a pit in their field. Whether it's full of water or it's empty. They have to make some kind of a fence, at least 10 fachim tall, to protect people. You have to, if you have something in your yard, a pit, a hole that's dangerous, you have to put some kind of public defense mechanism to help pe- prevent injury. Oh, next sentence. Or you have to put a cover over it. So people don't trip and fall inside of it and die. You have a responsibility to prevent injury in your property. And then he goes on to the, expand the principle. Any place where there's something that causes danger to others, it's a commandment of the Torah to remove that damage. To not only remove that, but to be very, very cautious. And it's based on this verse, because not only do we have the Pasuk that tells us that you have the parparet, the fence on your roof, but the Torah has an overriding principle of guard your life. And if you don't remove it and you leave the dangerous spot in your field, not only do you not fulfill the mitzvah, you're now being mevatzal mitzvah, you're losing the chance to do a mitzvah, and you're violating a mitzvah, the avar, the lo tasim damim, and you're violating the, the prohibition against um, avoiding blood death in your property, lo tasim damim. So that is clearly a Torah obligation. And there's even more in the Rambam. There's clearly a rabbinic prohibition, a rabbinic obligation. That's very profound. This is also Hilchos Ritzayach, same chapter, the very next halacha. The Rambam writes, The rabbis took that principle that you have to avoid danger, and therefore they forbid many, many things. And someone says, you know what? I'm going to put myself in danger. What do other people care? Do I have to care about others? Do they have to care if I'm in danger? I'm just not strict about that. I just don't, I'm not worried about it. I'm okay if I get sick. They are punished. We're not allowed to just say, ah, I don't care. I'm not so worried about getting, getting sick. There's also a minha, Jewish custom. The Torah says, the Rambam, this is now in Hilchos Deos, general hashkafa, general Jewish thought. Having a healthy body is the ways of God. The Rambam, who you know, was of the belief that the primary thing in life, the primary purpose of the Torah, is to come to a proper understanding of God and philosophical you know, worldview. So how can you do that when you're not healthy? It's impossible. Therefore, Not only do you have to keep pre- pre- have preventative medicine, keep yourself safe, but you have to be distant from anything that could possibly endanger your body. And you have to be, do things to keep yourself healthy. It's, the Rambam is saying we have to also keep our bodies in good shape. Here's some examples. You should only eat when you're hungry. Only drink when you're thirsty. You should you know, go to the bathroom right away when you, have, when you have to go to the bathroom. Just examples of, of actions we should be taking in order to keep ourselves healthy. So you see that there's this general value um, I'm just using the Rambam because I think he lays it out so clearly. But there's clearly this, this value, this perspective in Judaism that we have to do everything we can to keep ourselves healthy, to prevent illness, preventative medicine. And um, we can't just say, well, I don't care about this or what do others care about what I do? Um, it's actually a religious imperative in order to be a good, a good Jew so that you can focus on God and mitzvot. And, and also because uh, it's a commandment, we don't own our bodies. And um, the Torah commands us in, num- in, num- in a number of places to be safe and prevent damage. Just like you have to put a, a fence on your house 
to prevent falling. There might, there's nobody up there right now. No one's falling right now. You know, you could say, I don't have the virus right now. No one that I know has the virus, I'm fine. No, you have to put a fence. You have to prevent damage when there's a place where there's a likelihood of danger. So it seems from that, that um, vaccination is something that's essential. If it's safe and effective, it's something that should be done. That's why many, many rabbis, the vast majority of post scheme um, strongly require uh, vaccination. They really argue that it is a halachic obligation, a chiyuv to become, to get vaccinated. Of course, when it comes to the coronavirus and the, the COVID vaccinations, because of the fact that they're not as well tested. So the, the balance here is, are they safe and effective? So the trials have shown that they're effective. They seem to show that they're safe as well. The rabbis are more reluctant to say it's obligatory because we don't yet have sufficient data. But the rabbis, uh, the big post that I'm talking to and the post that we turn to, as they are discussing this matter with leadership from the CDC and from the FDA, um, we're hearing more and more um, calls from the post game that um, that vaccination is actually something that is required when it comes to COVID as well. Um, um, uh, Rabbi Israel Reisman from Torah Vadas, you know, said in a number of occasions already, the Torah says, you know, listen, the halacha is the Shulchan Aruch says, code of Jewish law, we have to listen to the doctors. And the doctors are saying, the professionals are saying, take the vaccine, we take the vaccine. Um, Rav Asher Weiss, who was um, not prepared right away to push it until he heard this feedback, started saying, you know what, based on what I'm hearing from the doctors, um, we should strongly be encouraging people to take the vaccine. Um, even if we don't mandate it, we should be encouraging everyone. It's a very bad virus and we should do everything we can to prevent its spread. Rav Hashem also said, you know, we have everything to, to gain and what do we have to lose? Which is an important thing. Rav Willig has come out and said he would be first in line to do it and that he thinks that it's, a, it's an obligation because it's high benefit and low risk. And so um, it, it seems to be that there is very strong encouragement, if not an obligation, for someone who's a Torah observant Jew to um, really strongly consider being vaccinated. It's, uh, it, it's, it's very profound, um, the, the level of encouragement that we are hearing from our rabbinic leaders. And, and I would definitely take that approach as well. Um, I mean, who, who am I compared to all these people? I'm not saying that I am, am in their ballpark in any way. I'm just saying from my perspective as well, from what I'm reading and what I'm hearing, um, it's certainly uh, a very important thing to do. And um, I myself will be vaccinated as soon as they will give it to me. I'll be happy, I will, I will do it, I'll, I'll be in line um, right away. So the question though becomes, because many people have this perspective of what I'm saying now, and they want to be vaccinated. This, this disease is horrible. Um, you know, I've been on the first front lines this whole pandemic. Um, without going into details, I can tell you it's not pretty. It, it's not a good disease. It's not a good virus. You don't want this. None of us want this. Um, we want to be healthy. And um, so we want to do what we can to prevent it. The question then becomes, so when you have a lot of people who want it, um, it, it's going to take months before there's enough vaccine available to vaccinate the entire world, not to mention the United States. So how do we prioritize? So I'm going to go back to the source sheet now and begin looking at some sources, some sources on um, how to begin discussing triage, Kadima, when it comes to the vaccine. So one approach is that of Ramosha Feinstein. This is what he, he, he had a, an approach, one approach that he took towards um, vaccination was that, you know, there's a, a, a triage in general. It was that first come, first serve. He, he, this came up um, once with penicillin when, when the, the chief rabbi of Israel called him in Herzog, Rav Herzog and said, you know, we have only like, I think it was eight doses of penicillin. We have 30 patients in our ICU who need it. Uh, how do we decide? And apparently the story goes with Tendler uh, Shlita said recently, um, well, we, uh, you simply give it to the, the first eight who ask, the first eight who are closest to you, uh, just first come, first serve. Um, not so easy always to determine that, but, um, but that, that's what he wrote. Um, he, he says it here in this Truva, Choshen Mishpat, Chelik Beis, Simon Ayin Dalad. He quotes, you know, there is the, the, the issue of the Mishnah in Horius, you know, it says like uh, Kohen before Levi, Levi before Yisrael. There's the different levels of who you'd give it to first. He says, but nowadays, um, you know, we, we don't follow that because it's too hard to, to know, um, you know, really uh, to give anyone priority to know who, who's doing more mitzvot. And um, so really the priority today should be based on first come, first serve. The, the first one to arrive gets it first. Um, however, a number of post game have, have challenged this view. 
Um, Rav Asher Weiss, for example, in his chuvas recently about the coronavirus, he wrote, he's referring obviously to Rav Moshe Feinstein. You first have to uh, simply um, go, give first come first serve quoting that Rav Moshe. Ah, He's, Rav Moshe Weiss argues that might be true when it comes to tzedakah and other kinds of communal priorities like that, but not when it comes to saving a life. It's not like someone, you know, acquires the right to the vaccine or something because they showed up at the hospital first, which, by the way, as a side point, the bioethicists have also pointed out that, you know, this could be a concern in our world today because, you know, it would favor the people um, who live closer to the hospital, which might not be equitable, might, might not be fair, favors people, you know, it might cause, encourage people to kind of rush or be dangerous about how they um, get to the hospital. There, there's a lot of ethical concerns about first come, first serve, uh, although there is something fair, but I, I understand what Ramosh is trying to do, but it's very complicated. But Rav Usher Weiss um, argues uh, that, no, this is not the approach we take. In fact, um, actually, Rav Usher Weiss, I asked him this, you know, I'm recording this in early December, December 4th. Um, 2020. Um, still, you know, everything's very new. I asked Rav, Rav Usher Weiss um, two weeks ago when we began really debating how we're going to um, um, give, you know, prioritize and triage the vaccine. And he wrote me a response. Um, he has updated it, some of the, the points of it, which I'll mention throughout this discussion. But um, I'll share with you the response that he wrote to me. And um, one of the main points that he makes is that, you know, what he wrote when it comes to um, um, triage for the ventilators is basically the same principles when it comes to triage for a vaccine. And as you see here, he writes, here's basically the rules um, um, when it comes to when it comes to triaging. Um, you see it there, uh, the first, that Aleph. So so his rules, and this is also exactly what he wrote when, when he wrote uh, Achuva about you know, when you have insufficient numbers of vaccines, I'm sorry, uh, ventilators available, who should you give them to? So number one, Cold, cold, um, his first point is, you know, can we can we say it's required? So he says, you know, it depends on. We have to find out first of all how um, how effective it is and how safe it is, and uh, it's certainly not prohibited. And if we find out that it's safe, it's required. That's his point number one. But then bet when it comes to to priority, he writes, Yesh um, et mi So number one, the person who's in the in more danger, the higher danger gets the higher priority. Right, it makes a lot of sense. Of course, it can't be that the actual vaccine is more dangerous. So, if someone's in very high danger of uh, if they were to re get the coronavirus, but the vaccine is even more dangerous to them, then they wouldn't take it, obviously. But although what we're seeing is that the coronavirus vaccine is very safe, and therefore, obviously, therefore, the person that's in high danger should be prioritized. Without the vaccination, if they would be in life-threatening danger, if they were to get sick, um, but they're not in more danger because of the vaccine, that comes first. Person in more danger. Number two, argues Rav Asher Weiss, who goes first, or who goes second, I guess you'd say. Next, we go to the people who are healthy, but we have a higher likelihood of saving them, right? It's, it, they're not as in, in much danger um, from side effects. There, there's not, we're not concerned that they will be um, in, in danger from receiving the vaccine. So, um, so that, that's his main points. Person who is in more danger is number one, and higher likelihood of being saved is his point number two, as he explained to me and clarified when we discussed. These are some of the general principles, you know. So Ramosha said, first come, first serve. Rav Asher Weiss says, you know, the person in more danger, that's who you have to save first. Other, otherwise, when you're trying to flesh it out, it's the person who's in higher likelihood of, of saving. I want to go back to the source sheet and share a, a general perspective on how, let's take a step back now and, and talk about what, are, what does Jewish law tell us that we should be focusing on when making these decisions? Is there a general hashkafa, a general principle that can help guide us? And there's a very profound, very unique, and very important perspective that comes out of Jewish law 
um, in particular from the Israeli posting who deal with triage a lot because they unfortunately have had the experience of dealing with um, um, mass casualty events, terrorist event, terrorist attacks, where they've had to uh, come up with um, emergency triage um, principles um, based on halacha. And so R Rabbi Dr. Avram Steinberg in his um, incredible um, uh, six volume book, recent book, Harafua Kehalacha summarizes this, this approach, what we, what we call in America, and this is the approach that was adopted in the United States about ventilator triage during the coronavirus pandemic. And we call it in English population health perspective. Uh, I'll read it to you. It's worth reading this in size. So I'll read to you Dr. Steinberg's um, words and I'll, then I'll explain it because this is a very important perspective and has a, a significant um, impact on, um, on how we um, how we approach this entire issue and, and the, the way I think about this issue. So, so he writes, but often maasi, practically speaking, kasher yesh nifgaim rabim hazukukim latipo matzil chaim. When we have many people who are, who are injured, who are sick, who need life-saving interventions, vigyu bevasa achas, and they all arrive at the emergency room at the exact same moment. Vein dai koach adam miyuman or imsai hatzala letapel bakulam beosuzman. And we don't have enough emergency medical interventions, medical professionals, to care for them all at once. Here's what we do. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Because normally you would say, OK, the sickest person, the person most likely to die, take them first, then the second most sick second. And the people who can survive, even though they're a little, you know, they're a little injured, they'll, have just, they'll just have to wait. She says, no, actually, it's a little different than that. He argues, Yesh tapel kodem benoni. The middle category you treat first. The moderately wounded, the moderately ill, the people who are very sick, very hurt. They could die, but they're not in momentarily dying. Ulidchos esatipulim bebetsuim kashe betsuim kal. And for the moment, leave aside those who are very, very sick or only lightly injured. Why? Shikena betsuim kashe. Because those who are very, very sick, very injured, they need urgent and, and time-consuming interventions. And when you're trying to reach a lot of people, if you, if you spend all your time and all your resources on just one person, that means you're going to leave a lot of other people without help. So that will cause... The doctor, the nurses will be totally dealing only with that one individual. And a lot of people will die because of not having care. And the person who's only moderately wounded, they can wait a little while and without having very serious damage. They're certainly, they're not going to die. But when you come to the moderately wounded, the, the middle category, this, on, in general, should take less time, but do more good because it will save their life. So those whom you can put in the, few, the shortest amount of time to, to maximize the benefit of your resources is who you should focus your attention on when there's an emergency. Kagon, I see it shut up down, like, like stopping the blood flow. You could save that person's life. And then hopefully you can go and save more people's lives. And then you can go and re-examine uh, and kind of figure out, okay, now who do we save? And then maybe we need to recategorize. Maybe there's more people who we can get to now. Because the situation changes. And obviously, as the time goes and you save more lives and you deal with it, the situation will change and you can recategorize and re-triage the individuals. So the approach that Dr. Steinberg is summarizing, which is the approach that you find in the writings of Rav Yitzchak Zilberstein, you find this supported in the writings of Rav Asher Weiss, is an approach where the goal is, how do we save the most people? How do we help the most people possible? So when it came to ventilator triage, for example, that meant sometimes, some were arguing, don't necessarily give the ventilator to the people who are very, very sick, whose lives can likely not be saved. It's not saying to remove the ventilator and kill people in order to save other lives, but it was saying when you have multiple people's lives and you say, well, here we have one person who might need a ventilator for a day or two and their life will likely be saved. And then we can give that ventilator to another person. 
Or we have someone who will need this ventilator, but they will be likely become ventilator dependent. They're going to be on this ventilator for weeks or months. And even with that, we might not be able to save their life. So what's the best use of that ventilator? So the post team often were arguing, well, giving to the younger, the healthier person might be a better use of that ventilator because then it can be used to save more lives. Whereas, interestingly, it's the opposite when it comes to the vaccination. Well, if younger, healthier people can survive fine throughout the pandemic without a vaccine, then maybe we need to prioritize the older, the sicker people when it comes to a vaccine because we can save more lives that way. But the principle here is save more lives, population health. How do we help as many people as possible? And that helps us determine the triage. What's the source for this? Where did Dr. Steinberg get this from? Where did the, the post team get this from? So it's fascinating. They get this from a source that um, the, the Chazonish quotes, quotes the source, you know, um, 80 years ago, that was an interesting case that really com comes up in philosophy um, that, you know, who knew it would become so relevant today? This source I'm going to share with you right now um, is now being quoted by um, Intel, by the, you know, different organizations that are building um, automatic um, uh, self-driving cars because they have to make sometimes um, ethical decisions. It's being, you know, utilized now in triage. And in, in philosophy, it was called the trolley problem. In in Israeli history, what had happened, I'll tell you the, the, the situation that happened and I'll share with you the Chazanisha's fascinating answer. Um, in, in philosophy, let's do that first, the trolley problem, trolleyology, they call it. So the trolley problem is as follows. It's always an interesting case to debate. Imagine the following scenario. You might have heard of this. You know, you have a train track uh, uh, that you're standing on the side of. You happen to be at a fork in the train track and you happen to just be standing there and there is, um, there, there's a lever that you can pull. And if you do nothing, you know, there's a train track just goes down the track and the train will just keep going. But you, you are in a spot where if you pull this lever, the train will divert to the right. And while you're standing there, you realize, oh boy, there is a family who decided for whatever reason to have a picnic on the train track and happens to be also, you know, um, um, they're deaf and blind. So let's just say they have no idea the train's coming, but they just chose this spot. A family of six eating a picnic on the train track. And you say, oh boy, this is horrible. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna divert this train and save that family's life. And as you're about to do it, you look and there's another person on this train taking a nap on this track. So now you realize, okay, here's my dilemma. And I have to decide quick. I do nothing, shave altase, right, passive and just allow this whole family of six to get killed. Or I do something, I do an action, and I cause this one person to die. So in one, in one case, I'm doing nothing. The other case, I'm doing something. But in one case, six die. The other case, only one dies. Usually I ask my students this question, they always say, pull the, pull the, pull the lever. So fine, the response to that is, okay, you think it's so simple? Imagine this case then. You're on a bridge. You're not, a, you're not at a crossroads. You're on a bridge over the track. Same thing though. You see, the, you see one family there, family of six eating a picnic on the track. It's only this time just one train, you know, just one car. It's enough that it, it's going to kill that family. The family is relatively small people. It happens to be there's a morbidly obese, you know, 600 pound person on the bridge with you, just kind of watching the view, um, sitting at the edge of the track. And you realize, oh boy, this whole family is going to die from that train. There's only one way it could save their life. That's if I push this man over the edge of the bridge, push him over, he'll fall into the track, he'll hit the train, the train will stop, that will save the six. Should I push the man over the bridge, killing him to save the six? This is the debate in philosophy called the trolley problem. You can Google it and find a lot of stuff on that. What happened in B'nai Brak in Israel was that a man was in his car, in his truck. And remember in the olden days, you know, this was not uncommon, but I'm, you know, when someone's brakes would go out, right? Just pump the brakes, nothing happens. So he's driving down, he has a big truck and he's driving down with this truck downhill towards a red light and he's trying to brake and this truck is not slowing down. The brakes are not working. And there's a tiny little car, one of the a bug, you know, Volkswagen bug in front of him with a full family. It's a tiny car. He realizes he's going to come smash into that bug and he's going to kill this whole family. And there's oncoming traffic the other way. He realizes, oh boy, uh, I, I, can't, I, don't, I can't kill this family. So he's about to swerve and he sees one pedestrian on the side of the road. The only way he can go is to swerve to the right and there's a pedestrian. He'll kill that one. And again, he didn't know what to do. 
swerve and kill the one or do nothing and kill the whole family. So the Chazunish dealt with this question. And as I said, this is coming up today with, with ethics. You know, they have to program self-driving cars to make these decisions. The Chazunish dealt with this and it's actually relevant for triage as well. Take a look at this. This is an amazing source. The, the Chazunish, and this is really in many ways what um, Dr. Steinberg uh, and all the post Dr. Steinberg just summarizing what these post based this population health perspective on. And I'll show you that Mr. Brewer too in a second. So the Chazunish says as follows. Chazunish, he says it in a couple of places. He says, um, can you turn it? He says, yes, I think you, you can turn, turn the train, turn the truck to avoid the family and kill the one. How? How can that be allowed? We don't give one life for another life. Uh, you know, it's better, sometimes better shave Valtasi, do nothing. So he says as follows, fascinating logic. Not everyone agrees with this. I'll just point out that Sitzel Eliezer, for example, disagreed. But here's what he says. It's not like the example where you're in a village, you're in a, outside of a town, and someone comes to you and says, give us one people, one person from your, from your city or we'll kill all of you, in which the, the Gemara says, um, no, you can't give over someone. You have to just rather let them kill you. Why is this different? In that case, you're not, you have to rather die and not give over one life. See, there's a typo there in this one. This is not the same as diverting the arrow. That's what the Gemara is talking about. The Gemara's case was very similar, but just, you know, in more ancient um, um, technology. You know, someone is an excellent marksman. They're shooting an arrow and they have the ability, whatever, however that's possible, to shoot an arrow such a, in such a way that it's going to go through this whole line of people and kill a whole bunch of people at once. You're, you're under the track of the arrow. You have a shield. You have enough time to just quickly move and divert it just slightly enough that it will divert to the left slightly, but it will still kill one person. Can you, should you let it do nothing? or divert the arrow to kill one. You do nothing, it kills five. So the Gemara there says, no, you, you can do it. The difference is giving over one life to the enemies who demand a life, that's that's a horrible, cruel action of killing, of saying, let me take this person who was otherwise you know, innocent, you're gonna just kill them. By actually giving over that one person, you're not actually saving other people. However, Ella, Shigram Hamikra Achshav, in this case, when it comes to diverting the arrow, Shipulas Ratsi Chazu, he Hatsala Lerabim. Diverting the arrow, diverting the train, diverting the truck is not killing anyone, it's saving. It all depends on how you look at it. Am I killing the one who I diverted towards, or am I saving the five? Who I am not allowing it to die. Aval hatias achets when it comes to diverting the arrow, mitzad zelad tad acher hiba ikara peulat hatzala. The Chazunish saw that as an action of saving life. Ubezayet tachen sheyesh liish tadel baatzalas yisrael bechol efshar. We should do everything we can to save life, so we can do an action, even if it allows others to die, because it's saving more life. And just so you see another example of this, where you even can um, um, let someone die because you, you let the, the most dangerous ill go um, to save the, the middle category is in the Mishabura when it comes to a house on fire and Shabbos. Obviously, if there are holy books or a corpse in a house, you can only save one, you save the corpse, right? Bori umasukan. What if you have someone who's healthy or one who's likely to die? Bori kodem. The one who could have a better chance of saving comes first. That's where Rav Asher Weiss and others um, base this on. So you see that we have a principle in halacha called um, um, population health. Hatzala sarabim. That's what we call it in, in Hebrew and halacha. Um, Hatzala sarabim. The, the saving of the many, saving life of as many as possible. And interestingly, I'll show you another tshuva um, that, that I have on this topic that was also written to me um, by Rav um, um, Yosef Svi Rimon in the Gush. He wrote, I, I asked him his opinion about um, triage in, in, with the vaccine. And he sent me this fascinating response that takes this approach clearly into account of public health of Atzal Sarabin. I found this fascinating and really, really important. He, he says, um, 
He wrote, Ani onek eight mamash b'ksara. I'm just giving you a brief response about tsarich l'ari harbe. Of course, there's a lot more to say this. He says, Yesh ne shikulim sh'yesh makom ladum b'hem. But here's the two main factors. Mi nimsa b'matzav m'sukan yoter, right? Exactly like Rav Asher Weiss said, exactly like Dr. Steinberg is saying here. The main point is, first, the person in, in, who's in, in more danger when it comes to the vaccine, ulechein yesh laktimo. Person in higher risk should receive the vaccine. Bet. And this is re really unique. I didn't see anyone else other than bioethicists. I didn't see any other post team uh, writing this, what Reverend Ramon wrote. Mi nimsa b'matzav shabohu mavir yoter et hamachala. Who is more likely to be a super spreader? This is the population health perspective, the Hatzal Sarabi. Reverend Ramon is saying, if there's someone, you know, if let's say you have one person who's in some, you know, they have, they're a high risk category, but they've just decided, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to stay in my house. I've got it all set up how I can stay in my house. I don't have to go out. You have another person who's some kind of essential worker. They are a teacher or they own a store or, um, or they're a doctor or whatever it means, whatever meth method, they are someone who interacts with others. And therefore, since they interact with others, they if they were to get sick, they would spread the illness. So Rav Ramon is arguing that the halacha would require us um, and I think this fits in exactly to the sources I've been sharing to vaccinate the person who's a potential super spreader because that protects the whole community, right? That person should come first. He then, he then analyzes this a little bit and his, his, his analysis is really, really interesting. If we look at this whole pandemic, okay, on the one hand, you know, we want to save the people who are in higher danger. If you look at the whole pandemic we've been dealing with, we want to save lives. We want to help those people. However, we want to look at the, the more general perspective of, you know, how society is doing, the, the economies, the, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the government. We want to stop the spread. So that should be who comes first. So how do we decide who's in who's in more danger or who's the bigger spreader? You know, maybe even uh, should should we take into account people who are less careful? Should they, on the one hand, be punished and say, you know, you're less careful, therefore we're not going to waste our vaccine on you, or should we say, you know what, we don't like it, but we need to vaccinate you so you stop spreading the the illness? You know, or someone, you know, let's say if they're in prison or they live in an old age uh, nursing home or some kind of a place where, where they're more likely to spread in that way. Um, that 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 is a very relevant um, um, criteria. If we go by what's happening now, then you know we have to just focus now on Yeshlach saying at Hazakenim or at Kol Mi Shem Me'al Gil sixty five, right? Shishim um, Echamish. We have to we have to uh, first focus on um, the people who are in higher danger, higher risk categories. Kol Mi Shem Nimsa Be Kavutso Sasikon. Anyone who's in higher danger. But in Neilech Lafi Hareia Haklalit. We look at the whole general picture, you know, not just what's happening today, but the broader picture. Then actually, maybe we should focus on the young people. They're spreading it more. They're going to school. They're not as careful. They're the ones spreading it more. So how do we choose? Which one? Those are two very different populations. So it's fascinating that he even brought up that perspective, because I think it's a really important perspective. Lamaisa but if I'm going to paskin, if we're going to give the halacha, it seems to me she shekivan sheyesh tekana miadit b'fanenu. We have a chola b'fanenu. This is a very important category, the classic category. This came up in halacha with the no de Yehuda with the issue of um, autopsies. When the when the rabbis were first asked, is an autopsy allowed by halacha? The no de Yehuda said, if there's a chola b'fanenu, someone right now before us who need, whose life can be saved. By this information, then we can do an autopsy. But if it's very, you know, theoretical and just, you know, just because it's interesting, we don't um, have the same need of pikuach nefesh if it's only theoretical, it's not someone before us now. So since we have that category of chola bifanenu, that we need to save the life in front of us, davar ze gover, that is more significant. That's more important. The, the person in front of us now. We therefore really, if we have to, we, we're just going to have to halakhically um, vaccinate those who are elderly or at high risk. Amna, 
However, gam davar zeh lo borer. That's also not totally clear. There's also other professional, you know, um, categories to look at. For example, do we know? We need to find out. Is the vaccine as effective for elderly people as it is for younger people? That's a factor to take into account. It's possible that it helps more, you know, one category more than the others. That might have an impact. But to conclude, the main point is now as Rav Asher Weiss said, as um, it seems to be clear from the post game, and as you know, the CDC also saying, the people who are in higher risk, the people who are more in danger, they should get the vaccine first. And he's basing this, he says again, it's all based on the Nodi Buddha and Divri Chazunish. The Chazunish is not the one we just read. The Chazunish on the Nodi Buddha says we can expand what we mean when we say Chola Befaninu, that the sick person has to be before me now, to mean a, a sick person that I know is going to arise somewhere in the world. It's the high likelihood um, that also is taken into account. Shikasher Hari Usa Lefaninu, when this illness, this, this issue is before us. That is what we consider life-saving. In our case, the, 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 the illness is before us. We're just looking for something that's as effective as, as, um, as possible, and therefore it's not exactly uh, the same. The certainty of saving a life right now, that is what comes first um in in halacha so we we have so far and i'm just gonna I just want to point out a couple more more issues but so far we have that the the main category it, the great main criteria is to save the people who need it the most people who are most in danger very similar to um what the cdc has advised and, the, and governments around the world but you see we come to it from halachic perspective and sometimes when you use these sources as our basis they can have nafkaminas they can have practical ramifications. And so it's important if you're looking from a Jewish perspective to be able to anchor our perspective in halacha and the sources and see how that could have, have an impact and what that, what that might mean. Now, for example, is age a factor? Do, do, we, do we look at age? Should that be something that we're taking into account? The, the posting do discuss this um, in, in quite a bit of, of detail. So um, for example, and this is interesting because um, there are those who want to include age as a factor. I'll just show you something. I'll, you know, I'll show you this first. It's a very interesting thing that some bioethicists have brought up. And the question is, does halacha accept this or find it um, uh, offensive? It's something called the sale. You can look it on the screen down there. Sale stands for Standard Expected Years of Life Lost. And they, those bioethicists who argue that we should be looking at the sale of each person, um, not the sale of each person, it's not that we're, um, you, know, um, <laughs> you know, valuing people's life um, monetarily, but they're arguing that you, you calculate, you know, how much, like, how long a person is likely to live and how much life you will therefore save if you save their life now. And, and this approach obviously tends to favor saving younger lives because they have more life to live left. And this is an approach that some bioethicists have been um, advocating for. You see this article that I quoted this from this from this from September 11th. So it's already uh, you know uh, a little bit old and and it has not been part of the perspective um, that is being implemented by the government today. Um, but it is inf influencing some perspectives around the world, and it, it is relevant. So does halacha take that into account at all? Um, is is age ever a factor? So interestingly. Now, look at where Moshe Feinstein writes in another, another tshuva, another response about, um, about triage. He writes, Yesh hagedim, you should first give priority to you should give, you should, you should prioritize the person more likely to survive. So indeed, someone who has a likely, higher likelihood of survival um, should have a higher um, um, priority of intervention, more than a year. Why? Because Otherwise, they are considered. Um, it's 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 you know if they have more than a year to live, that is 
um, that is a, that's considered a full lifespan, less than a year to live. The issue is chayesha versus chaye olam. Chayesha is temporary life, terminal, uh, less than a year to live, according to Rav Moshe. Chaye olam is regular lifespan. So if they have, you want, you're looking for for someone with more than a year to live. Shehu lo avad cheskas chayim shelo mi chola acher more than another person, that according to the doctors, that won't likely live more than a year. That they're considered to be a trefa to the doctors. And they're even worse, they, they can't live more than a year. But when it's that they won't live more than two years, we only care about the ability to live more than a year or not, meaning after, are they terminal or not? But if they say, well, they can only live for two more years, three more years, but not 20 more years, that doesn't matter. We don't look at the age in, in that way. We only look at, are they terminal or not? If they're terminal, we might not be um, required to expend the same amount of of limited resources to prolong their life. Of course, we would never kill them, God forbid. We would never hasten their death. But would we focus our limited resources on them versus someone who has a normal lifespan? But only it's it's terminal versus not. Not we don't factor how long they have left to live if it's more than a year. That's what he's arguing here. So we do not agree with sales, according to Rav Moshe, even though we have somewhat of a similar perspective in terms of there is some similarities there, but certainly it only goes so far. Um, yeah, and he, he quotes, closes, closes there by saying, "Vamiras harofim shalo yuchal lichiot lo migar klum cheskas chaim shalom." Just the, the the doctor's statement about that um, does not impact this decision. Then he goes on, "Ubedavar zakein muflag." Just in the bo- bottom underlying part, "Ubedavar zakein muflag shenechla who who is sick, a very very old person." Vade mechuyavin l'raposo. We are certainly required to save their life, but mashe efshar as much as we can. Kamol ish ta'ir, just like if they're young. Doesn't matter if they're young, old. We do everything we can to save their life. And even if they say, no, I'm so old, I don't want to live anymore, we do everything we can to save their life, no matter what their age is. The age is not um, a factor in halacha. In fact, Rav Usher Weiss wrote very similarly in his response that related to um, COVID. He says, Gilo shala adam, mashmaut mishkal hilchati. The patient's age is not a factor. Only God who gives the life to every person, that's the only one who knows who will die in their time and who won't die in their time. And also, we don't know how much uh, uh, what a person has left to live and, and um, what type of life it is. We don't, we don't worry about um, their age. Um, um, Refer Schechter also wrote about um, about this issue, um, and, and his his point here is is very interesting, very relevant. When it, it's he's writing about um, the ventilators, but he's also writing um, about age factors, and it's very relevant. He says, <laughs> two patients come at once. <laughs> we have to decide who do we give that one ventilator to. <laughs> you can certainly save one life. Or the shrini shiyesh rak safek in yoel. The other person is in doubt. As pshita she ain dochin vadim ifnei safek. You for sure save the life who is more likely to save. Aval im bo bezeach harzeh. But if they come one after the other, kvar chibro as a rishon the ventilator. You already give the first one the ventilator. You don't take it away from them. Going to the next paragraph. Achein. However, im b'sha she ba zakein hamasukan techila. As we said, as I mentioned before, if the person who is very sick comes first. Kvar yodim me rosh. That you know, in a few hours, younger patients who are healthier, as I mentioned before, because it happens every day, and you know you won't have enough ventilators for everyone. That's considered all at once. We for sure, then you don't have to... Um, Intubate the sicker one. You wouldn't extubate. You wouldn't remove it, but you don't have to start it. Aval, and this is important. Now, that what we said above that the elderly person who is in danger versus the young person, the reason is clear to everyone. 
So pay, this is important. Do you benefit more when you um, treat the younger, healthy person? Why? Is that because we care about younger people more? No. No, it's not because they're just going to they're going to live 40 more years. No. In other words, he's saying here, we reject this concept of sales. It's not because he has 40 more years to live, whereas the other only has five years left to live. How do we know he's not going to live to be 120? And the other person is only going to live a few more years. Though Yisrael Leno shoot and also, even if he only has five years versus the 40 years, we don't know who's going to use their life better, who's going to be more productive, who's going to help society more. To my who says, who says whose red is, blood is redder? Blood, blood is redder. What I mean by this is, when it comes to the elderly patient, even if the respirator helps him or her, they will only live a temporary life left. Which Shachter also defines as 12 months. But if you save the younger person, exactly the point that Rav Moshe made, you're saving a non-terminal life. And that's what we um, give precedence to in Alacha. Um, um, so, so shechai olam adifei michai isha. So, if someone has um, the likelihood, the potential of living a full lifespan, they get precedent over someone who is terminal, who is in the dying process. When you have limited resources, now this brings to one last very important factor. I'm going to stop here just for a second to just explain this issue, um, and then I'll conclude with it because I think it's a very, very crucial issue and one that I think about a lot and that is very relevant. That is. When all else is equal, it's a tie, right? Every factor, when you look at the person, you say, um, you know, they have the same level of, um, of danger, same level of need, same risk factors, but you still have more people who need the vaccine than the amount that you have. So are there any communal need tiebreakers? Meaning, do, can certain people in society ever get precedence based on who they are, what they represent? Can you ever prioritize certain types of people or certain people over others? And fascinatingly, um, you know, the state of Israel dealt with this in a very clear and, and I think profound and, and important and, and, and um, 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 praiseworthy manner. And actually, I have a translation of it that I'll show you um, what the state of Israel did. They were slightly different than what some pla other places did, but I'll show you what they did in Israel and then what their sources were. This is um, Dr. Avram Steinberg was the head of that committee as well, even though it's, a, you know, the secular state of Israel. And incredibly, they have this, you know, orthodox doctor who's also a pediatric neurologist um, heading their committee. And everything he writes in there, every single word is based in halacha. I've asked him, what about this? What about that? Every single point in this policy that they came up with, um, there, there is a source in halacha for why they chose what they chose. It's really incredible. So let me show you what, what the state of Israel chose when it comes to triage for um, the ventilator triage. But this is relevant, again, uh, far beyond that. So the state of Israel, um, this was their triage rules, right? This is the position paper, triage decisions for severely ill patients during the COVID pandemic, Joint Commission of the Israel National Bioethics Committee, the Ethics Bureau of the Israel Medical Association, and the Israeli Ministry of Health, accepted by the by the Knesset, May 2020. Here's what he writes. The triage decisions will only take place on a medical basis as described above. Therefore, the following factors will not be included in the triage decisions, right? In other words, everyone's equal. So you cannot include, you cannot give someone presence based on religion, race, gender, nationality, country of origin, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, social status, family status, citizenship, occupation, None of those factors can be taken into account. Every human being has to be treated equally. That's the law of the state of Israel and the Allah. Years of life, as we just read about, including age considerations. The chronological age itself is not a legitimate consideration in the triaging of life-saving treatment, but only as part of the combination of risk factors. Disability is in itself not a legitimate consideration in triaging life-saving treatment, but only as part of the combination of risk factors. Circumstances that may be considered the patient's fault. What if the patient was negligence, right? Which may have caused COVID-19 infection. Still, that cannot be taken into account. 
merits for the patient from their past actions at this time. You may not take any of that into account. Everyone must be treated equally. But there's one exception. They do have an exception. One exception. What's their exception? Healthcare professionals, even if infected while treating COVID-19 patients, will not be given priority unless it is necessary to overcome staff sh shortages. So they don't get priority, but sometimes they do. If there's staff sh shortages, either by facilitating return to work after their recovery, right? You need them to come back. Or as an incentive to volunteering, you can tell them, okay, we're gonna, we're, we want you to work and put yourself in danger, but we also wanna reassure you that we will also care for you if you get sick, right? So it's either by facilitating their return to work after their recovery or as incentive to volunteering, when there is medical equality between two patients, healthcare professionals will receive priority. That's what the state of Israel decided, not all other um, countries or um, individual health centers, healthcare centers, um, um, took that approach. Many said, no, nobody gets priority in any circumstances, not even healthcare providers, but the state of Israel did. What's that based on? Fascinating. R R Dr. Steinberg showed me it's based on a Gemara in Orius. I mentioned before the Gemara that discusses, you know, triage. So the, the Gemara also discusses, well, what about when you have more than one Kohen, right? So, um, you, you, and, and you have the Kohanim that need to, um, um, you know, become contaminated. Right, so the two types of coin you might have is the is the here, let's just read it. The Gemara says as follows: Amar Mar Zutra, Breder of Nachman, Tashma, the Tanya, Sagan Umeshuch Melchama. So what do you have? The Skan coin Gadol, the coin who's the backup for the coin Gadol, prepared just in case he's needed, or you have the Meshuch Melchama, or the coin who's going uh, to lead the troops in battle to inspire them. And they see there's a mace mitzvah, a body that needs to be attended to. And they, the one coin is going to have to lose their status, their um, purity as a coin to tend to the mitzvah. The one who has to go to the war, he'll have to save, deal with this body. That one will have to go into the Kodesh Kedashim. Vatanya. Meshuch Melchama, Kodl Neskan. But in other cases, we've said no. The Meshuach Mechama goes before the Kaskan. Amar Avina, Kitanya Hahil Achiyosa. That's when it comes to saving his life. Why does the Kohen Meshuach Mechama's life get saved first? The one whose job it is to lead the entire troops in battle versus the Kohen Gadol, the Skan Kohen Gadol, who might have to serve in the base of Mikdash by himself if needed. Rashi explains, Achiyoso, who called the Skan Mishum, that Sibur Srichim Lo. Because of the concept of Rab and Tzichemlo, the community needs him, the Meshuach Melchamat Litzorach Melchamat Tzfei Miskan. Therefore, he's more needed, and therefore you have a concept that communal needs. If a person is needed desperately by the community, whatever that might be, if that was a certain, it could theoretically, if it was a politician, a rabbi, a doctor, there, there could be certain people that you could make this determination that they're needed by the masses, and that might give them precedence. Not everyone agrees with this. Rav Shechter, when he wrote about this, quotes a different Gemara, very similar Gemara. He says, Mishnah and Sophorius says, Hova Seder Kanimus Batsal's Nefashos. So, Besof, he says, Shem, um, Shema Shemamzer Tamil Chachem Code, then, right? And Mamzer Tamil Chachem goes first. I am uh, in the Grosses in your idea here, Kodin Yoshalmi, Shah Sidron Kodin Le Papalan, that you would save the life of a Torah teacher who gives the, you know, the logical, clear order of teaching comes before someone who's in the Pilpul, who's a complex teacher. Um, for the, you know, for the more advanced students. Why? Venira, the reason seems to be, Shakovea Beze, who Shemagadimim, Lahatzel, Aze, Shakahila, Tricha, Lob, Yoser. You save the person's life who's more needed by the community. I am Iris Moshe, Shakash, then he says, Shakashala, Sos, Maisa, Al Pi, Klali, Mishnah. We don't really follow this, um, the Mishnah in Horios, um, Bleed in Gabo, because it's too complicated to really know. Um, um, and, and then Rav Shechter, um, um, argues here after the parentheses. Um, um, yeah, no, let's say let's read in the parentheses. In Mistama, high time in the Hachi Isa Shema be Mishnah Yeah, the, the, this is that same point. He's making that point there about um, you know we we can't choose who goes before who because we don't really know who's who's um, holier, who's closer to God, who does, does more mitzvahs. So after the parentheses, but Davar Zay Kasha Meod Ligvoa Mi Nitzrach Lekila. This is what I want to read. And Rav Shechter concludes, but we can't really know who's more needed by the community. Um, um, 
you know, it's very difficult to say who's more needed by the community, me, Nitzrach, the Kahila, Yosem, me, me, right? The Maichazis, who can say who's more needed? Umitamze, Hamakubal, Eitzal, Poskim. So he argues from Schechter that the tradition amongst the Poskim is um, Shalolin Hog Al Pi Hamishta, that we do not follow this Mishnah, and therefore you don't even give precedence to the one who's needed by the community, though that's not the approach that was taken um, by the state of Israel. Now, let me show you what um, the government chose here. Um, and this is on, on this page and just some concluding comments um, uh, about that. Um, okay, so I'll try, I'll make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. So the government, and the truth is um, this changed slightly since even this, um, this chart came out because actually um, 1B now, they're actually um, residents of long-term care facilities are now in 1A, are the highest priority. And that's because the United States has found that 40% of deaths have been um, um, people who uh, live in long-term care facilities, even though it's only 6% of the population. So um, there's obviously a very high risk factor. Um, um, so, uh, so we'll look at this and they, this approach does agree with that approach of the state of Israel, of Dr. Steinberg, that the first phase are high risk health workers and first responders, in addition to people who are living in long-term health care facilities. And the idea is that, you know, um, in vaccine triage, we do give precedence, more feel that we should give precedence to frontline healthcare providers, because in this case, it's because both the instrumental value that they play in society and because the pandemic response, right? They're, they're instrumental, they're crucial in the pandemic response that healthcare providers, and because they're considered high risk, right? So they are also high risk, meaning if we're prioritizing people who are high risk to receive the vaccine, so healthcare providers are high risk by virtue of their job. Of course, many healthcare facilities, what they're saying is that they give priority amongst the healthcare providers to those providers who are at higher risk, over 65, have comorbidities. Um, they will, even within the healthcare providers, receive the higher priority. But the basic approach in the United States, and really you see as well in Halacha, is those at higher risk um, uh, um, first, whether they're in healthcare, healthcare workers um, and uh, people who live in long-term care facilities and um, older adults. And then, you know, as I mentioned that those who are needed by society, Robin Strichenlo, I gave as examples, oh, you know, you need doctors. Maybe you could say you need rabbis. You also need teachers. That's crucial. Who does the community need more? The community really needs its teachers, the schools to open. So you see they put here in phase two, K through 12 teachers and school staff and child care workers. Maybe even you could argue halacha will put them into phase one, because if we're going to argue that we value in halacha who's needed by the community, Rabim Srichemlo, that Sibur Srichemlo, who's who's has communal need, maybe we could argue that teachers should go even higher, right? Get the yeshivas open, get the schools open. Um, that becomes a very, very high priority. Um, so you see here just a taste of what the halachic approach is to these issues. There's a whole lot to discuss. And the truth is, um, there's a lot of questions, a lot of questions that are coming up now. You know, um, uh, if people who are higher risk are the ones who should be receiving the vaccine, well, um, now we have issues of people claiming to be at higher risk because they want to receive the vaccine, but it's not honest. And is that, that unfair to those who are really at high risk? You have people who work in healthcare centers or in nursing homes who don't actually interact with the patients, but because they can claim that, well, they're in healthcare and now they put their name on the list, is it fair for them to be receiving um, higher priority because they're associated with front care workers, even though they're not themselves on the front line. Um, employers, now when they are determining who should receive the vaccine amongst their employees, and someone claims to be high risk, or there's two people um, who are otherwise equal, does the employer have the right to access their private health care records to determine on their own who's really higher risk? Um, should someone who's themselves not a high risk, but feels that they can be a role model for society and encourage others, should they get precedence or should they receive the vaccine? in order to be um, a role model. Um, what if someone says, you know, I'm high risk, but um, you know, you do some research and it turns out they're, they're not a high risk. Um, what about a, a blessing? We're gonna be so excited to receive the vaccine. So people will wanna, you know, make a blessing. Uh, you know, I'm receiving the vaccine. Should that be done? 
I think it should. And, and I, I uh, hopefully, you know, the day will come soon that I'll get the vaccine and I'll, I'll make the bracha. But then again, you could argue that, no, you make the bracha right when the vaccine is announced, that it's, you know, that the FDA passed it, or right when it comes to your community, or right when it's announced that, you know, enough people have been vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. Um, lots of lots of difficult questions there. Um, but still, we need to thank God that um, God has given humanity the ingenuity and the brilliance and the strength to um, persist throughout this pandemic and to um, develop vaccines at record rate. May God bless the healthcare workers and all the vaccines to be safe. May they continue to be safe. May people who need them receive them quickly. And may we be out of this pandemic speedily. And may these the time the time tested the ancient wisdom and incredible values of the Torah continue to guide us, to guide us as they have through this entire pandemic and our entire lives to show us um, an inspiring and ethical way to deal with these challenging questions where we can live with integrity with the Torah with God and keep to be making a kiddush Hashem in our society and maybe have a time when this pandemic is over and everyone is healthy and safe. Shalom. Thank you. Contact me anytime if you have any questions, jason.weiner at cshs.org. Thank you to the OU West Coast. Shalom. Mm -hmm.